Welcome again. Uh, good to see you all. Um, my name is Tony Wachiku, for those of you who don't know me. This is CDR London, um, a night of ideas and tracks in the making, um, a night for you, producers, artists, um, people passionate about music, um, along with playing tracks that you're working on during Open CDR. We also get the opportunity to um, talk to um, and uh, chew brains of um, amazing artists and producers um, today. I'm particularly proud that we have Bok Bok with us. Pick it up. Hey. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's been, I'm really happy about this. Yeah. Oh, me too. How are you doing, sir? Good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. And you? Um, not too bad, actually. Um, so I haven't heard your name around for a while. I've been about. Um, right you've been about. <laughs> <laughs> and a huge contribution to you know the scene, um, but for those of us who um, well let's actually, let's go to the beginning. Um, at what point in your life and career did you think you know music was for you? You know we've all got you know we're all busy kind of chasing you know mm -hmm. careers and stuff. But at what point did you think you know what music's the thing that I really want to focus on? Uh, definitely never um, <clears throat> intended it to be a career. So I was just in I was in the world of design. That was a past life. And then kind of hated it. Um, was hating my life, but at the same time, music was just bubbling at the side. And it was just, it was just, it was like, it was like the release. It was like, I'm sure it's the same for everyone, but um, it was just the nice thing in life that was the good, the good bit. And then everything else was like the shit. So it was like, um, yeah, it was just, it just happened by accident. Um, just got more and more opportunities. Um, in fact, you know what? To be real, I first started just writing about music, um, okay. like blogging. Um, so that was kind of my way into like taking part before I was even making music. Then from, from there I went to DJing kind of, um, um, and then, um, from DJing production happened naturally. Yeah. So talking through yours kind of early, what were you making? You know, what were the first inklings and what was your setup if you can remember it? So I definitely remember the first DJ setup. It was just like very bad deck. It's like not quite belt drive decks, but, um, Definitely um, Gemini decks on the, on boxes on the floor, yeah. like in wherever I was living. Um, and a Vestax little scratch mixer thing. The, the whole thing must have cost £200. Um, and, um, and then the production setup a few years later was just like a cracked copy of Ableton. Or not cracked, but probably just borrowed off. You know, like when you got a spare license from your mate. Um, making edits, just trying to make edits and... My whole world was grime at that point, so it was just it was like grime edits. Um, trying to it w then it wasn't for ages until I actually started making trying to make beats. So it was just really just trying to use Ableton for its most basic yeah. functions. And was the grime edits just like a, a way to get in there rather than having to you know start thinking about you know what your identity was as a producer or artist? Yeah, I wasn't thinking about identity as a as an artist or producer at all. It was literally just to have dub plates. Um, just to have like fun exclusive things to play like i was obsessed with putting vocals over over grind beats or over beats in general um and before production i used to do it on um like uh oh sick you can hear the trains um like productions like um before production i used to just make edits with um having an acapella play off off of one bit of vinyl and then just literally record bootlegs like that just manually from from my from uh, from my decks and um there'd be bits the that are like out of yeah. time you know <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was literally, I wasn't thinking about any identity things. I just wanted stuff I could DJ with that would make me stand apart as a DJ. So that was literally it. So, um, for those, those of us who weren't around, you know, what was, you know, you talked about grime and, you know, what was the scene like when you were growing up, you know, particularly when you started DJing, tell us what it was like. My main thing was, um, cause I went to grime raves as well, like things like Sidewinder, Young Man Standing and all these kind of raves that were... Predominantly MC driven, um, but then I was also really into going to Plastic People for things like Forward and CDR, funnily enough. Um, but Forward, that's really where I feel like I was born in, in Forward, um, which for those that don't know, was a night in a club called Plastic People that was in, um, in, in Curtin Road on, in Shoreditch, um, which is long gone, but it was a good spot, really small, very dark, um, really big sound system. So, legendary. Yeah, no, we miss it. We do indeed. We do indeed. Um, so we've got something from you from that period, right? So 
This yeah. is before we it's played made, it. Made a little bit later. Yeah, this little is bit like later. Yeah. I made this in like 2010, 2011. Yeah, but definitely inspired by that early period of plastic people just yeah. taking in. Like for me, I was waiting until they stopped playing dubstep and started playing grime. Yeah, that mm-hmm. was my thing. I mean, still like the dubstep, but you just kind of waiting until which grime is just more exciting. So definitely that kind of like I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, if anyone knows their grime here, then things like Dump Valve, that's Genius's old label. That was like the main kind of influence. So it's not like kind of eight bar gram, darker gram stuff. Uh, yeah, shall I play, shall yes, I play please. Silo? Yes, please. So this track, um, this is later because by this point I already started my label, which is called Night Slugs. Um, and this came out on Night Slugs. Sorry, there's so many versions of it. But before we that, yeah, actually before we play that, yeah, let's talk about the label. So from re-edits, um, doing nights, you know, at what point did you decide, you know what, I'm going to start formalizing what I'm doing. Yeah. Instead of the label. Yeah, yeah. You know, how did you hook up with Jason? Uh, oh, you, you, oh, obvious. Night, night. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you know what it is? We oh, we hooked up through Blogs, through Blogsphere, um, because he was putting stuff out. He was actually kind of more on the production tip before me, and he inspired me to kind of get more into it. Um, so it really, after after meeting him, I started actually doing more of my own original, trying to make my own original productions, figuring out how you actually make certain sounds from scratch. Um, but what made me formalize it was really my friends started to make tracks as well. And so if that's if it wasn't for that, I don't think I ever would have pursued it or, or taken it seriously. But it's just that healthy, not competition, but I'm I'm really like. Um, a lot of people say this, and it's kind of a buzzword, but I'm really community oriented in a big way. Like um, I definitely need like like-minded people to be doing stuff with and I just get gassed up by my friends doing good shit as well so yeah it wasn't until people like um like some artists you might, might know like girl unit um elvis 1990 jam city all these kind of people from the early days of nightslug started also making tracks that's kind of what really inspired me to actually pursue it and the label really was for them like we just needed some for it somewhere to start releasing music no one else was signing any of it um, it didn't really sound like much else, although it sounded like a lot of other things at the same time, if that makes any sense. But, um, cause you know, it's just a continuation of other stuff. It's just a link in the chain. So definitely was drawing on a lot of influences, but also the way it was bringing them together was quite at the time, quite original. So yeah, we just felt like we needed to have a platform. So yeah, that's how it came about. So yeah, let's, let's see, hear something from. All right. What, long intro, should I just leave it? All right. It's actually quite nice the way it yeah, gets to the suspense. You guys know I'm meant to hear this normally gets mixed into other things. So. Ooh, the suspense.
Ja, das ist ein Cheers, guys. Thank you. So, talk to us through, talk us through, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, that track is called Silo Pass. Um, and it's really made to fit into a grime set, um, but also definitely, like, drawing influences from some of the other things I was into at the time, like um, a lot of Southern rap, things like uh, Free Six Mafia, um, just, yeah, a ton of Southern rap. Um, so, you got the kind of Hey chants kind of in there in the same way. Um, obviously, that bass line is definitely referencing, as I, as I said, Graham, that world of like where Graham meets dubstep. Um, but also, it's off a of Juno 106, so it's kind of trying to also channel. I was really into like Acid House as well at the time, still am. So it's definitely trying to kind of channel that kind of, um, like where those things kind of cross over, like where does Graham meet Acid meet Techno meet, you know, Crunk meet all of these different genres, which is what Nice Lugs was really kind of focused on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's um it's great seeing how you've built the label based on these identities. You know, what genres that you're talking about. Um, so from what happened from here in terms of this came out, you know, mm. the scene is kind of emerging. Tell us about the scene at the time, um, because it was quite a big scene, right? Yeah, I mean, by this by this point, things had gotten quite like uh, we'd already been through. So like, obviously, when I started out, I was really just into grime, and then by the time that we come round to these early days of Night Slugs releases, it was like things are a lot more diverse. Like we'd already grime scene kind of stopped being a club environment, basically around uh, I want to say like oh seven oh eight. Things got really. Um, I mean, Form Six Nine Six, the police really had their influence on shutting that down. Yeah. For those of us who um, don't know, 696, what? Form 696 that? was a fucking racist ass form that you had to, that promoters had to fill in. Um, if the police suspected that you might have an event with, basically, let's be real, people of color there, um, of certain genres, like garage, started in garage, from, started from garage days, but by the time Grime came around, if they got whiffed that there would be um, anyone playing Grime or any people of color playing other music, then, then they would try and use it as an excuse to shut it down. And the form was fucked because, sorry, am I allowed to swear? The, f the form was fucked because it was like um, they literally asked you what genres are you guys playing and like what, what ethnicities of people are going to be performing. Like, wild. It's quite bait, right? It's bait. It's bait. And it's only been abolished a few years ago. Uh, quietly. Very quietly. So anyway, this is what we're dealing with. So, um, so that kind of had its effect to put off a lot of for various reasons, the the club scene. That was one of the main reasons but other reasons too. Like the clubby side of Grime really fell off and we lost that kind of garage fun you know, dancing aspect to it. And it really became all about MCs releasing mixtapes and um, it just became more, much more of a, like a rapid -y rap kind of genre, if, if, that's, if that makes any sense. And that's okay, but it wasn't quite my bag. I definitely was looking still for that kind of momentum of like rawness affecting your body on a big sound system. So I had started to see, I see just look wider basically. And so by the time we got to this, this stuff, like Silo Pass 2010, 2011, um, we'd already been through a lot of, also UK had been through a lot of genres because we'd, the, a lot of the grime scene had moved on to UK funky as well. A lot of the producers had moved on to making something that was, again, for the dance floor, influenced by House, influenced by Soka, um, you know. Crazy uh, Cousins, etc. Crazy et Cousins, etc. Yeah, and I was a big, I was a big part of that, not a big part, but I was a part of that as well. So yeah, we've been through all these different iterations and me as a DJ, I, I got into a lot of different other stuff. Like I was looking for that grime energy um, and just looking in different places. And, um, you know, at the time, um, looking to niche American genres like Baltimore Club, like Detroit with Ghetto Tech, you know, Chicago with Footwork, Duke, How even the whole house, history of house. And just trying to bring all, that, all those influences back to the UK and seeing how they could fit into what we were doing over here. Um, so that's really, by the time Night Slugs came about, we had all of that stuff in there already in the bag. Um, if that makes sense, yeah. And what was it like, um, you know, running a label and DJing and making <laughs> music and, you know. I stopped making music for a number <laughs> of years because the label thing. And, you know, Code 9 warned me about this when I started my label. He said, watch out because your life is going to disappear. And it, it really does just eat, it ate my life up because the label was pretty busy and kind of doing well for, uh, for you know, when, when, when we popped up. Um, so, yeah, it does kind of eat your life up. Um, definitely wasn't living the best way, but um, no regrets. No regrets indeed. So you got something more uh, slightly later in time, right? Yeah, yeah. later. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was going to play for you a track called Melba's Core, which features Kalela. Um, ah. 
And for those that don't know, Kalela is a singer. I'm sure you all know her. Okay. Um, sorry, there's so many versions of everything. Deleted. I, I also can't read you guys, so if anyone can actually <laughs> read, As in then point me towards. Glasses. Well, I just it's it's more of a memory scan. It's more of a scanning dyslexia yeah. thing. So, where's the original mix? <laughs> sorry about this. Um, well, okay, this one I'll do. So slight departure in terms of sound, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, well, in <laughs> some respects, in some respects, um, yeah. just I think for me, mostly the, I guess the drums, the drums are definitely mm. rooted in that kind of early eighties, almost like DMX. -y yeah, it was made on a yeah, DMX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But obviously, programming is contemporary and spacious, as you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I, for me, it's like still I'm programming grime drums in my mind. So. Even to, even at that point, which I'm not really doing much of these days. So um, for me, I, it's like yeah, it's departure, but I'm, I can't tell in a way. I mean, so I mean, and I mean that just because um, I guess departure is not the right word. I guess it's just it sounds it's like an evolution. Exactly, and you know, obviously having vocals is always take takes things yeah, in different directions. Hundred well, percent. Yeah, the vocals you know, is yeah, way, yeah, 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 yeah. How did that collab come out? Um, we met in LA through, at the time we had a, a kind of a sister label called Fate to Mind that was based in, in LA, um, that she'd started working with, uh, uh, kind of a young Kalela had, had just gotten involved in, um, with, with, um, Kingdom and with Fate to Mind. And then soon after this, we developed a whole mixtape that was like between the two labels, between Night Slugs and Fade, we kind of made a mixtape for her. Um, and then the rest is sort of history, but yeah, she's, uh, that's literally just how we got involved. And I, th I think I went to one of her, I think I went to maybe her, one of her first ever shows or maybe her first ever show. And yeah, from there it was just unstoppable. The connection was just great. So, um, but yeah. So with all this action, you know, obviously got a deal with Warp in terms of distribution. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So what, how was, how was that? You know, I guess you're a busy label, you were, you know, you were obviously, your own music was put to one side so you could focus on the label. Labels mm. growing work really well. Mm -hmm. And with any label growing, you've obviously got artists to deal with, with their needs and aspirations. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so you know, how, what was that journey like, particularly with working with Warp and how, I guess, the business side of things de developed? Yeah. Um, in the end, I liked, it. I liked doing things DIY better. And in the end, we took it back and everything became in-house again. But I think the Warp era was just an attempt to um, see how we can scale what we were doing really and um obviously warp is something that i grew up with and so it was kind of an honor, honor to even be in that house of warp um but in the end it felt like they were quite um, you know let's be diplomatic but they, they're quite they're quite they're quite a big entity and it, it wasn't really my bag like night slugs is very diy it's really just me um doing a lot of the stuff and a bit with a bit of help from friends and a lot of production from friends so yeah, but in the end, you know, took we took the distro back to um, to the to Rubber Dub, who we work with from from up in Glasgow, and it's just a family affair, and it's better that way. So, so yeah, but good, you know, nice to try it out. No, of course, of course, yeah. of course. Um, so I guess are you learning to delegate nowadays? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
No, I'm just up, I'm just up till four in the morning doing accounts and stuff instead. Um, instead of making beats. So so yeah, I should. Please 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 don't do everything yourself, guys, man. Just show yourself some love. But yeah. But you are making time to make music, right? Yeah, yeah. more time yes. now, and I've gotten yes. better at I've gotten better at structuring my time so that I um, I'm like, is this vitally important right now? No, but creativity is vitally important right now, and so I'm gonna go and do that for you know today, and then I can get to my emails tomorrow. So it's just you know, whereas I think a, a, a younger me would have been like, put that to the side and just answer all the emails. So. And also, I guess it's the music that got you there in the first place, right? Exactly. So and without that, there's no email. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have this project for us now, which is, I guess it's, um, talk yeah. us, yeah, before we hear it, um, yeah, talk us through. Okay, cool. Um, the, the now, but actually before that, um, I guess, as with all of us, we go on this kind of production journey. Um, you know, obviously your sound is evolved. How would you say that your sound has evolved, you know, since, um, you know, in the last, say, eight to ten years? Okay, um, damn, eight to ten is lo is a long time. But what what I will say is, do you know what? For years, my sound was just like too diverse. Like I know what my influences are, but I think that I made it quite confusing for people because I'm grime, I'm house, I'm this, I'm that. You know what I mean? And obviously, when I DJ, you can I think there's a sound to it, and I think if you come and see me perform, you're gonna hear my sound. But I think when I put out a mix that's like first I'm working with Colella, then I'm doing my house thing, then I'm doing this, then I'm doing that. It's just a lot for people. And um, just in the last few years, during pandemic, I actually started another label called AP Life, um, which is something I'm doing with my friend Nami, Nami Wems, um, who's a producer from Croydon. And um, that really helped me to focus in on what it is I want to do with with myself, with Bok Bok and Night Slugs. Because once, I, once, once AP Life came together, that came, kind of became a, a home for things that are like, not grime, but like in that lineage and really connected to London and the, the the experience we have here every day and this kind of, you know, reality of London. And I think that that allowed me to actually just keep Night Slugs as like an ex uh, imaginary escapist place that is about rave and dancing and, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's just separating those things out. It really helped me massively. And so I think like since then, just even the last few years, if you listen to my rinse show, it's just gotten so much more focused. Um, I'm really in my, what I keep calling my house bag, but it's not really, I mean, I do play a lot of house when I DJ. I'm not really making anything 4-4, but it's definitely all uh, in that kind of house adjacent area and those kind of tempos. Um, so yeah, that's kind of become my focus in, in, recent, in recent times. And it's been really enjoyable. Um, it's just so nice to actually focus after all these years and just get, just you know, it's taken me a while to figure out what, what I'm truly here for, but this is it, I think, for now at least. Would you say that I guess the, the you know, early Bok Bok is, is about just, you know, just expressing yourself, you know, just, you know, you had all, yeah. these, all these genres and um, influences that you, you wanted to just express yourself. And I guess over yeah. time you've been able to, yeah. Yeah, as you said, just focus in. And, yeah, I think know, so. Yeah. It was just freewheeling yeah. and it wasn't, I wasn't concerned with any kind of audience really. Whereas like, not that I am, not that I'm making tracks for people to, like, not for myself, but for other people, but I'm just, I'm just focused in a good way. Like, it's, it's about being inspired as well and uh, just seeing how much you can do with uh, some constraints, really. Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. constraints are good. Absolutely. Especially in a world where it's like anything's possible, all genre walls have come down and, you know, we help do that. Um, so now it's nice, it's nice to take it to a place where it's like, okay, but what is the actual thing, though? So, yeah, with that all said, yeah, what have you mm, got for us okay, now? Okay, yeah. So this, I've got a project up for a track called Duetto that I put out this year from an EP of the same name, um, which, um, shall I just play it? All right. Let's have a listen.
Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, um, first of all, before we dive into the actual project, um, what was the inspiration for this sound, this track? So, it's definitely part of a body of work. Um, there's more of this kind of stuff on the way as well. Um, I've also been making a lot of like edits around this kind of beat structure and just a lot of inspiration-wise. Um, in my DJ sets, I'm playing a lot of this kind of stuff. Like, And when I say this kind of stuff, it's kind of like house tempo, it's a bit broken. It's got that kind of 5-4 thing going on. And that's major for me right now, where it's like, obviously house is based on 4-4. Four, four. Um, it's yeah, still- It's a counter rhythm kind of thing. It's a counter rhythm. Yeah. It's making the kicks, making there being five, five kicks a measure, or just figuring out kick patterns that are like a bit more broken that can still fit into this kind of structure of, you know, you can still run a straight hi-hat over the top of it and it still kind of sounds good. Um, yeah, and you know the worlds of um, the worlds of UK funky, the worlds of the worlds of like deep house, Afro house, um, things like gom as well, that genre, um, all kind of influencing the sound for me. So, yeah. All right, so let's go. Maybe go from the should we go from the top? I guess. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Okay, so uh, so yeah, I'll run you guys through the project, man. Um, so let me, let me put this away. Um, Top one is, this is last minute edition where I clocked that this sample just made it that much more liver. And this is a track called um, Funky Angel by some defected, some defected or, you know, one of these kind of, one of these kind of noughties, deep house kind of releases. It's like, but there's a lot of them have really good beat, um, B sides where the beat, it's just the beats. And yeah. that is the kind of stuff that like, People like Circle and other DJs from uh, but playing the deeper side of UK funky start kind of like popularizing, um, and it will just be like they'll be just be digging on like Beatport or like Track Source or something and find like the, the B side to some progressive house release that will have like a sick drum track. Yeah. So it's that kind of world of like tribal house basically. Um, so that's the sample from that. With just delay on it and stuff. You see my you see my chaotic channel strips, guys. Indeed. See my mad channel strips, man. Some of them are some of them are simple. This one's nuts though. You're working, and I literally you're, just you're add working, stuff. You're working at Apple Silicon, man. I am, but this is made on the shit on a on the on the shit machine, but somehow still managed to pull it off. But do you know what? I, do you know what? Basically, I'll just craft. So you see, what, every one of these modules, I'm just like, oh, I just want to do this next thing to it, but I don't want to change how it is already because if I don't like it, then I can just remove this module and go back to how it was. So that's why you see so many different things here. So, I don't know. So, yeah, it's like that. Um, this is extreme, though. Not all, you don't say. Not all of them are like that. You'll see. Um, all right, next one. Uh, this is literally just a effect like this for, for drops and stuff. So, just to create a bit of a moment at times. Um, then I've got a group, sometimes group up melody like this, where, and th this is actually, do you know what? Basically, I used to have, like, you see that track Melba's Call that I played for you, second track I played tonight. That had about 100 channels. So, yeah, don't be like me. Just don't do that kind of stuff. But I've, I'm, I've reformed because this has only got about 20 channels. <laughs> so um, I'm just a reformed overworker. So what I'm trying to do here is just, you see how normally my melody track would have some processing on it. My melody channel group would have some stuff on it, but actually it's just a group to, just because it's nice to be able to do this. No drums, you just got the production there. Yeah. With just can a, you open it up so we can see? Sorry? You open that, that group up. So Go open the group. Yeah. yeah, so the group is there below. So you yeah, can see okay. these are the things that I'll run through. I'll run through them individually, but it's nice to just be able to just click like this and just. Right. And then it's like, again, even for mixing and stuff and just for composition as well, I find it really useful to group up drums and melodies. And groups and groups was the best thing that Ableton ever introduced for me. Like, that was nuts. That was a game changer. So. Definitely use groups a lot. Strings, um, I use a synth called Spire. It's a nice synth. Uh, so in this so case... So the question was, yeah, what do you use the groups for? Guess, yeah, yeah. This, in this case, the groups are... This, this group is literally so I can just listen to my melody parts without my drums in there. Um, but sometimes I also use the groups for mixing and... I don't know, I just, I just like to arrange it like that. Because then also as well, if you want to look at your project in a really simple way, you just do that and then you've got three things there. So as well, just be able to put the whole melody away. And then also look, I can turn off that and just listen to my drum track as well. Also super useful as well. 
Essentially subgroups, right? Essentially. Subgroups, yeah. And also, w this is good as well, because I, I find this kind of stuff inspirational too, because I know I'll just listen to the melody and be like, oh, I can make like three different remixes of this. Okay, moving on. Um, so yeah, Spire for the synths, for, for the for the strings there. It's just, this is a great synth. Um, if you don't know, get to know. Um, and the strings have got sidechain from the kick and from the 808. Get that pumping going. Yeah, not all the way though. See how they're wet and wet. Um, next, this is recorded from. I've got a bunch of synths. This is from one of them. Um, I really like synths from the mid '80s. Um, so just the organ from a synth. Um, some bunch of processing on there. Um, this is just a bell sample with some reverb on it playing some kind of like a very simple chord, like a two, uh, like, like these, that's it, really simple, just keeps it moving. Um, wave station, what is this, this will be another bell, yeah, this melody, there's wave station, yeah. I see your low pass doing quite a lot of low passing on this. Is this just for this section or, you know? Oh, mm. um, oh what, this? Yeah. High pass, high pass. High pass. Yeah. yeah, no, this is, no, it's like this the whole time. Yeah. It's actually like this the whole time. You can see there's not, there's not automation on it. So it's just high like that. Yeah. Don't like too many lows muddying up your thing. Mm -hmm. um, that way you can pump more into the bass. So definitely if you don't need the lows in there, just don't have them. That's my advice. Um, this is a sample that I've, I made by, by mistake by pitching down um, a kick from DJ Gregory tune that I was sampling. And then so I accidentally pitched it all the way down and it was on a really crispy mode. You know that mode when it's on texture? Yeah, yeah. And it just sounded like this like robot crunchy voice thing. It sounds like this. So I resampled it and I've been auto-tuning it and just using it a lot for, just as a stab basically. And you'll hear it in all my tunes recently with a bit of chorus on it. Bit of reverb on it. Um, the SR, I use the SR a lot. It's meant to be for vocals, I guess, but I just use the SR as a filter a lot of the time because of the way that it um, is selective. About it's kind of like a, it's like kind of like having a side chain for your tops. Um, so it's nice to control the highs that way. Uh, I don't definitely like to control the highs. I don't like too many tinny highs. Um, this is a sort of long bass, Drake bass. I guess people call it the Drake bass. Not really, this is different. And what instrument is it playing at? Just for out. It's from Spire again. This is from Spire. Yeah, Spire's got loads of really good patches. Yeah. Um, so that's that bass. Um, then there's your 808. Look, there's not much on it, see? I, I told you some channels are going to be empty. This is a great soft clipper, guys. This is a great soft clipper. This I use because it emulates the soft clipper from, not emulates, but it's the same as the soft clipper from um, Fruity Loops. So if anyone's into Fruity Loops. So for those of us who haven't used a clipper, what what is it? And okay. Yeah, what does um, it do? It's actually not even limiting. This one's, the limit is turned off. So I think I'm just using this for saturation. Normally, you just use a soft clipper to um, control the transients of, of, how, of how loud something is without losing the the power of it essentially and you can also make things louder with it as well in a way where it's kind of like normally i don't really believe in make, using compression to make things louder but clippers are different because of the way that they um process your your transients and there's just something crunchy and nice in there that you can use if you figure out how to use that well you can kind of get a lot more volume out of things like kicks and just your loud the louder parts of your track it's good to control the volume on them with using clippers. So that's this one's not actually doing that because it's this is off. So right here is just a good, really good saturator. And then that way it's like the I don't know if anyone uses Fruity Loops, but the thing is, as an Ableton user, you have to do everything yourself. It's not going to do the software is not going to do. It's not going to make your track sound a type of way, or it's not going to give it an aesthetic at all. You just everything's just open. Whereas things like Fruity Loops, obviously it's a, it's a little bit easier to just kind of get a bit of a sound out of it straight away. And there's there's a reason that a lot of really good music gets made on Fruity Loops. Like um, a lot of the favorite things that for us DJs, like things like all the American club stuff and UK funky and a lot of grime, grime stuff, a lot yeah. of grime and a lot of um, 
a lot of the biggest rap songs ever are all kind of produced on, especially the beat is produced on Fruity Loops. And so it's little things like this that kind of make it special where it's just got these kind of beat built in like life hacks that just sound great. So standard clip, this costs 30, 30 quid and I really highly recommend it. Um, it is a great clipper. So yeah, that's, and I'll show you the difference. Um, so this is my 808. And this is a sample that I would have made this is from my this is from my sound kit. Um, so at some point I made this 808, but it doesn't sound as beefy without the clipper. So I'll show you before and then after. You see how the low note lacks that body. The marks difference. Yeah, and it's clipped out. See, it's red. Well, I'm not really scared of that because then there's more clippers later on. So. But it's clicking without without distortion, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 exactly that. That's what soft clippers are good for. It's just clipping without distortion, basically, hence the soft part. Okay, moving on. Um, this is a log, drums, log drum sample um, from, I would have had Fruity Loops in here as a plugin, but it was too bulky, so I just flattened it down, squished it down. You can actually put Fruity Loops as a plugin into Ableton and use the sounds, which is cool. Um, so there's your... There's your log drum. Um, obviously. I'm a piano casting there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Which I wouldn't want to use too heavily because it's just some people are abusing it a bit at the moment, but it's nice to just sprinkle a bit in there because it's a great bass sound. Uh, okay, there's my drum bus. So drum, well not bus, but my drum group. And I do, I do have this channel strip on there, um, which, what's it even doing? It's not even doing anything. Ignore me. Ignore me, this isn't doing anything. Because you see the filter here is turned on, but it's not actually turned up. Um, so that's not doing anything. So this is another group just to literally just group stuff up and control it like as a group. Um, if I wanted to, I could put some processing on it. And other projects I do, but I'm trying to keep things simple at the moment. Um, so this is my kick drum. Um, um, and this is being saturated by this thing this is the, great the classic is that psp it right? is yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love this i haven't seen that in a while yeah, yeah. still using i'm still using stuff from the from the noise but why not it sounded good um this is oh it's flat so ignore it ignore me but you know what this is i'll show you i'll show you one time when i'm actually using this properly um i'll show you another one but yeah there's the channel strip actually doing something for a change so a nice channel strip um so it's just got a bit of um a bit of high pass there um, a little bit of um, this, like expander, and this is some weird button that makes it analog, which it doesn't, but it's, you know, makes it a bit more fuzzy or something. Which sometimes you want to just take that slight like HDness off a little bit. So uh, before and after, it's like this. And that's the difference is being made by yeah it's like these two the uh, the, the dynamics and the high pass. Um, okay. See, then there's another kick for the intro as well, um, which is just another kick really, just because I felt like it wasn't the the main the main kick and the main tune just wasn't given for some reason in the intro. Then this is a snare that I sampled from another one of those defected in the house type songs um, called Feel This the Beats. Again, just from the from the B track of the B side of one of these kind of defected, and it's got loads of processing on it again. And um, what else? Oh yeah, that's it. So yeah, that's that snare. Um, this is a shaker loop from um, Alan Rincon, um, who's um, a Mexican. Um, what's that genre called again? It's like in trip. It's all triplets. Uh, no, similar, but it's. Yeah, it's similar to bachata, but it's not quite that. But anyway, just yeah. Yeah, can you hear how it's triplet y? Um, I think I might have cut that up as well, or I looped it in a way that's um, changed anyway. But um, so yeah, cut that up. And also, one cool thing about this is volume shaper, because it sounds quite a lot different without it. So I've got this thing on there, which um, just controls. It's a nice plugin that controls the. It's like an envelope. It's like a volume envelope that's on um, set to one bar. It just gives it a bit of movement. Yeah. Um, anything else cool on there? Let's see. So yeah, this. Oh god, I'm not really using it properly again. This multiband thing. I'll show you another time when I'm actually really going in with it. Done a bit of side chain. Um, 
more of this. I use the channel strip a lot. Sometimes I just use it for the filters. Did you have to learn, and that's the SSL clone, right? Or, yes. or clone. Yeah, 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 yeah. So did you use that one particularly because you're familiar with it? Or um, I do, yeah. I, I, have, I have used it, like IRL, um, but really and truly, I just, I'm not, I'm not even sure. I think it was on sale. Yeah. So it's not like I was like, I need this particular strip. Yeah, sure. It was just, it's just a nice strip, but it, is, it does sound really great. So I do use it a lot. Um, Bit more, yeah. This is actually quite a mad chain, but you see, some of, some of my chains are just I just want to like really, really design the sound and craft it. And others, I'm just like, cool, this is this is fine, I'm just gonna leave it. So, this is a this is a hi hat rack from my 909, three different, four different ones. Because you know, when the, the 909 produces a hi hat, it's always different. So, I thought I'd keep that movement in there, and it's very subtle, but all three of these are all four of these are very slightly different. Um, I just resampled them, and yeah bunch of stuff on there as well let's see if this is any good nah this, these are all rubbish man i want to show you one where it's wild because sometimes i use that i use this thing a lot but um a group for percussion quite a weird rhythm on its own but it sounds nice when you slow it into the rest of it flanger on the delays on the um, loads of stuff on the but I just think I'm not a good example for you because my chains are complicated and that's just how I work. But just you just don't need to be like me. Um, what's that? Crash. Yeah, nice and simple there. Just a bit of reverb. Um, snare. Nine nine snare there, probably. Yeah, nine oh nine snare with a filter thingy like this on it to make it go. Whoosh. Collapse. Probably for my 909. Hard pan, so I've got one going left, one going right. Yeah. And then so one thing on the old um, tracks for each of the... Um, I guess you're a fan of having each sound on a track rather than, say, having a drum whack with yeah. a variety of sounds. I would have done you, that, you, probably. Because you want that yeah. control, I guess. Yeah, yes. totally. I, w I, w I would have probably had these... Um, it depends. Sometimes I work like, yeah, throw them all in the drum rack and then compose with that and then separate it out for mixing. Other times I do actually add one element at a time just because it's nice to, especially if you're working on something that you want to be quite uh, minimal with and every hit needs to be in its own space, then it's really nice to just throw in one element at a time. So I think with this one, I might have just actually done that and just put one one thing into the beat at a time. Yeah. Um, then there's two of these stompy things. One's got a reverb, one doesn't. Um, Oh, the other one's like lower pitched and got delay on it. But yeah, they just create a nice accent in the beat. Not super audible on its own, but definitely creates a nice kind of kicking. And that's actually it. Um, this lower thing is just another demo that um, a previous version that I would have had in there so I can AB to it and go, oh, the mix is ruined, go back to that. Or, oh, I'm done, good. So like I'll, I'll be like this, I'll play that back. And then you know, kind of compare back and forward a lot. Can I show them? I want to show them the notes. Absolutely. So this isn't for this track, but this is the kind of thing. So I'll go away and listen to this this version here. And I listen to it like in a car, I listen to it on, on earbuds, listen to it on laptop, earbuds. I said earbuds already. Uh, earbuds are important. On my phone as well, I'll listen to it at the phone speaker. Um, and then I'll make these kind of notes. So this is my self-talk here. Like this is, I don't know, have a quick read, but it's, um, I don't know if anyone can relate to stuff like this, but you're walking around um, the city, just completely in your own space, writing yourself notes of, oh, I changed the transient at 219, whatever it is, you know, and just whatever, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then go back and and then implement the changes. And then you've got the old version there so that you can make sure that you didn't fuck up. How often would you do repeat that? So in terms of this idea of mm -hmm. demo version, yeah, you know, make some notes. You know, is there is there a, like a cycle, two or three times, or just yeah. the once? Or yeah, 20, not twenty times. Or? Depends. Sometimes it's when it gets to twenty times, it's annoying. I, I'm really this is the thing. I am reformed, so I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to change and leave that in the past. So I think at this point, it's kind of like like my my philosophy. Like I never used to have a philosophy around it, so I think I used to just keep going back and making changes until uh, I was happy. Um, like for example, that track mob was cool that I played earlier. I probably took the best part of a year. Just let's be real, it's too long. So um, I'm done away with that now. So we will only do a few rounds of these kind of notes and changes now. Although what I do do is you can see this is 
project number 19, duetto 19 up here, which means that it would have been, you know, yeah, this is the 19th one. Um, that includes mixing and stuff like that. But what I tend to do is, and I'm a, bit, I'm a bit OCD, so what I will do is every time I make a change that I think, if I might regret this change, I will save a copy. And um, so my folder has all the other ones in there. And so at any point I can just be like, and it's happened countless times. I don't regret doing this because there's been so many times where I'm like, you know when you work too late, you lose perspective um, and you want to go back later and then you've got a bounce but you've already saved over your project and then you're kicking yourself. But I, don't, I, I won't be in that situation because I'm going to have the project. So there's been so many times where I've reverted or you listen, you've produced it for an artist and you've listened together with the artist and they're like, oh, I like this, you know, I like this from there. Can we put that back in there? And you're like, yeah, I still still have that version. So yeah, let me just pull it up. So have you, had to, have you ever had to, you know, um, I guess Ableton's great for this, where you've said you've, you're on number 19, but there's something in, say, version 14 that you need to pull out. Have you ever had to do that? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And the thing is, with exactly, Ableton's amazing for that because what you can actually do is you can drop any amount of one project into any of other projects, including you can even have, like, say the sidebar here. Not many people know this, but you can, well, obviously people do, but you can drag a whole project from in here into here. So you can literally have it inside your, so I can put a whole project into this project now, uh, which is massively helpful. Um, but also, I mean, that's an extreme version, but also you can just have whole channel stripped ready to go with arrangement, mixing, everything, your chain, your whole arrangement in there, just drop it in. And um, and that's really convenient because especially if you're working with um, with artists, you really don't want to be cooking from scratch in the studio. Like that's a total waste of time. Um, they'll just get distracted and lose focus, and then you won't record anything, and you won't get a good you won't get a good session out of that. So, especially for situations like that and collab collabos and um, and for art sessions with, with vocalists, I like to have stuff that I can just drop in whole drum kits, whole arrangements, almost uh, ready to go. And Ableton's really great for that. So. Cool. So yeah, and then I can just run you guys through the um, the auxiliary stuff. So then there's, I use I use return effects. I don't know some people don't use them. I use them. Um, so there's just the chorus there, really simple. Again, usually these things would have massive chains, but I've, I'm I'm trying to fix up. So um, there's a lot less going on in this one. Usually I would at least have an EQ, but and it's it's just to make it. Uh, shit, what is actually in here? Oh, do you know what? Yeah, there's not that much in here. Normally, what I try and do with these is like create a whole texture that's at the side of the track. That's like a little auxiliary mix, um, and then when you mix that back into the original, it gives it a kind of tech, you know, yeah, flavor. Yeah, um, but this one's kind of got it. I guess it's a bit like um, like parallel compression. Uh, well, parallel. There is a parallel yeah, compression. Yeah. That's the next one. So yeah, it's literally that. It's like parallel flanger, like parallel chorus. Um, and the great thing about that is that you don't. You know, you're creating something unique in your track that you couldn't do in any of the channel strips. Um, that just helps glue it all together and make elements feel like they're in the same kind of room or world or environment. This is the parallel compressor, so you can take a look at what I do there. I actually use the same chain pretty much on everything now. Um, a parallel compression, if people don't know, it's just it's the I think it comes from drum and bass originally, but it's just when people just it's just people trying to squeeze more and more out of their tracks, really. Um, but again, I kind of use it to create like a very compressed version of my track, uh, of the drums, especially the drums. And um, what it does is just kind of create more fatness in the drums. It's kind of hard to explain, but this is it without it. And with. Kind of subtle, but can you more girth, isn't it? Yeah. More girth, yeah. yeah. Slap, yeah. like more, not slap, because that's an actual separate thing. But like, just the drums just actually slap. Like they just, there's just a bit more presence on them, especially like in the top. It's really good for making like things like hi hats pop through in your mix without having them too loud. Um, so that's what kind of what I use this for. And uh, yeah, you can see again, I've um, I'm not actually letting any bass come through, not low low bass anyway. And then, and then from there, I can saturate it. Um, and that's the compressor, obviously, and then, um, and then this is this is a nice plugin. Um, this is a transient designer, so this is this lets you control your attack and sustain um, of your, each sound separately. So in this case, uh, what I'm doing is just making the attack a bit bolder on on all of these, because because I've compressed it over here, I'm now able to make to like bring out more of what's left of the attack. So it's kind of counter, kind of going back on itself a bit, but. 
that's how the text is created. And then, yeah, my favorite. Okay, and then, yeah, a little delay over here. Simple enough. And that's kind of it. Um, I'll quickly show you my master as well. So there were days when I would not have anything on the master channel and try and do the track to minus six. Um, as in over here, I would have it to, you know, to peak, peak at minus six so that giving my master and engineer the most amount of options, whatever, but I just don't believe in it anymore. Um, just don't care. And also, um, also the songs that we were talking about earlier, the genres we were talking about earlier, like the, your, your Baltimore clubs, your Jersey clubs, your, your grime, your, 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 your favorite rap productions. None of them are doing any of that stuff. They're all soft clipping. They're all going to zero. Um, and then pushing levels, um, getting the sound they want whilst they are working rather than hoping that another person will interpret their work. Um, so, so yeah, so I've just gone through it and I've started to really, and you can see there's my, there's my soft clipper and it's actually doing the thing properly now. So I'll show you. You can see here, see these red, these red bits is what it's chopping off. So without it, this, this would be clipped, this clip to fuck. And to be fair, what I tried to do on this whole EP was barely mix it. So I just really tried to mix as I went along, which is completely new for me. I didn't used to do any of that at all. I used to spend ages and ages mixing and would go through, you know, many iterations of this kind of stuff. Um, so what I didn't do on this EP was any of that really. So you, there's hardly any EQ on it, all of it, but then, oh yeah, tiny bit of EQ here just to get to get, get a bit more, more highs, but that's really it. And so without the soft clipper, it's like this. I like distorted the whole time, basically. And I could turn it down, but I just didn't want to. So, um, so there we go. Soft clip. Um, that's it. Time for ask questions. Um, so if you have a question, oh, he's ready to go. <laughs> so we've got a microphone. We just get, wait one second. We've got a microphone. Um, just stick your hand up and then the microphone will come to you. That, we? Just so you know, I'm opening another set here because there might be things that I can just show in there that weren't in the other one. Absolutely. This is actually, I should have just shown this, but I wanted to show some original work. But um, so I'm making all these edits from, from a template, which we'll I get, thought we'll was interesting. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. I'll let you do your question. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I enjoy your music for sure. Thank you. Uh, it's the first time hearing you, so yeah. Um, what was the reason for like taking that decision to not have like several versions of a mix? Was it like to explore yourself or like? Uh, it's just to save time yeah. because I've just realized that I was um, obsessive mm -hmm. and I am OCD. So I just need to be less like that. And um, sometimes it's good to lean into, but it can just take your life over. So it's nice to just um, let things be a bit and um, and it really was about saving time. Because again, when I was working on ECP, this year we've had the anniversary of Night Slugs for like 15 year anniversary now. So that's been a lot of, um, like, ah. Thank you guys, man. I wasn't expecting that, that's sick. But, <laughs> Jeez. but yeah, no, thank you. But, but honestly, it's just been, it's a, it's a lot of like office work and a lot of organizing shit. So it's just, I was like, just really trying to minimize my faffing about with different mixes and just was like, let's just fucking just do it. So that's all it is. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Yeah, question how's it going? Here? Hey, thanks for the interview, man. And congratulations on 15 years. Like, Thank you. Night Slugs is always, as long as I've been in, in the electronic music, Night Slugs is always just there, like doing its thing and top quality, seriously, all the time. So big up. Love. Uh, although your channel strips are giving me the fucking fear. So you, <laughs> please you, don't be like me you, need you don't need to do all of that yeah. you don't need to do um, all of that mike i got a really specific and like nerdy yeah. question okay um those ssl strips that you're using yeah. I'm, I'm don't really understand what they're doing is but, that <laughs> is that just for like eq and filtering basically? uh let me bring one up and i show you basically you. okay so sometimes i don't understand what they're doing because the thing is you see this little button here this analog button this is a mystery to me. Like I'm not really sure what it's doing. I think what it, I think what it does is it makes things a little bit, a little bit less HD, a little bit more like rounded. Um, they kind of model the characteristics of the exactly. Of the desk, so, so yeah. So all these, all these, all these, what are they called? Bra brain, whatever. Brain 
brain brainworks. Yeah. All these these type of plugins. There's loads of them. This this is not only one, but like there's loads of these kind of plugins that are trying to like model real equipment, and they spend loads of time like passing signals through it to work out like what its characteristics are to try and recreate that in digital. And so essentially, all that is is um, is trying to be closer to you putting it through a real desk. Um, so I sometimes just use this button to just take the edge off a little bit because you know how digital sounds can just be a bit in your face and it's just quite like a lazy way to make things a little bit more tucked in and rounded. Also this dynamics thing din down here, this is actually um, an expander slash you can also make it um, a gate as well. I think it's in it. Yeah, I think it's in expand mode right now. And um, again, it just is, I don't know if you work with gates, but it's, it's really useful. Um, just makes the sound a bit more rounder. Also, short sounds are good, especially for drums. So like a lot of the time, I mean, it depends on what you're doing, but a lot of the time you actually don't want the tail from, the extra tail from, from your sounds is just crowding up your mix. And it's the initial first transient that you're actually interested in. So that helps with that. Um, and then a lot of the time I'm not using it for any of that. I, a lot of the time I just use it for the filter section up here just because I find that it's got a nice filter algorithm or whatever it is they've created. is It's just a nice sounding filter that isn't, you know, some filters like the Ableton filter is very like whoosh and it's very extreme. This doesn't really have that. It's, it scoops it kind of subtly until you get to the top, you know? So yeah, it's just a, a really nice way of filtering. So yeah, a lot of the time I'm not doing nothing fancy with it. Thank you. Question. I got a question actually. Cool. It's a two and a half parter. Okay. The first question is, how do you separate your sessions out? Because it looks like if you're doing emails half or a few hours of the day and then doing sessions, do you just work in arrangement and then you just gather your sounds like prepping and then you try to find what works around it or do you just, because it looks like you split into two, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, with the emails, I just try and do that at home. And then once I'm in the studio, I try and just not even look at any of that stuff. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm a night owl, chronic night owl. So I'm really like, I'll just spend my days doing all the admin office work, do all the phone calls, all the meetings and shit, and then just go and work on when no one could disturb me until like stupid o'clock. Um, but you're asking specifically about like the, pr the process, right? Yeah, because I was wondering workflow-wise. Because yeah. I'm guessing, do you arrange as you go? As you kind um, of feel like you've got eight bar and then you move on? Yeah, I do like to, what I do like to do is try and make an eight bar loop. And then when you've got your eight bar loop, then you kind of try and think, what part of the track have I just made? Like, is this the main part? Is this maybe like intro -y? Is this, this Does it need a bass and then it could be a main section? Or if it's the main section, is there a counter melody that can bring in that can bring in like a B section or something like that? So I just try and uh, what it used to be is I think in the first session I would always if the track was going somewhere because you know some projects don't and then you just put it aside. But if I feel like it's going somewhere, what I'll try and do is before I leave, I'll get down an A and B section. And obviously I come from grime, so <clears throat> like the, well, for us the two sections was enough because all you need is eight bars of this, eight bars of that, and you can just roll on forever. In theory, um, sometimes all you need is eight bars and you can roll on forever. So that's another type of track. But at least just get that core idea down so that the next time you come back to it, you're actually inspired to, f to do something with it. You're like, yeah, that loop was fucking sick. I got to finish that. Um, but these days, I actually try and go further and actually just arrange it straight away and just force myself to throw it down. Because really, the biggest test of your eight bar loop is when it's unlooped and it's actually running on the timeline. And you're like, this is repetitive as fuck. Like, I've got to... I've got to do something with this. Or I've got to move on and this is rubbish. Or this is working so well, I know what to do next. Um, and even just try and take out a few things from the arrangement and then suddenly you've got a you know, it's got track coming together. So I will try and do as much of that in the first session now because that way at least I will um, not have to labor myself to try and finish it later. It's just try and get as much of that raw energy from the first session as possible. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Another question? Question here and then on the right. Hey, thanks a lot for the, the talk. That was amazing. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier the Quaze sample that you time stretched to, to fuck. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned how you use that on a bunch of other tracks in your EP. Yeah. Is that something you do commonly? You have like a motif or a theme that you carry across an EP? Um, I've started to do it more. I mean, in the past, I've, I've had it more like the drums. Like the palette will come from the synths or the drums that I'm using or um, 
like trying to use the same bit of equipment on across a, a whole project. Um, but also, it's kind of natural, isn't it? Because you make stuff in batches anyway, and you might be into a certain sound kit during that time, or you might be into a certain bit of hardware that you're just banging at the time. And so that might be your, like, I don't know, DX7 EP or whatever. Um, but uh, now I'm really a bit more conscious about it, and I've actually kind of even got, like, uh, see what, the, what I've got brought up now? I don't know if anyone's been hearing any of these edits that I've been making. Um, it's a hard body label. Yeah, thing. this kind of stuff, yeah. It's just, it's really just, it's really just making very quick edits. And like now I'm kind of moving on to making more originals with this template, but it's literally the same kit each and every time. Um, so I've gone from almost working from scratch each and every time to actually throwing the same kit on, on to everything. And uh, so yeah. just to clarify, because that, yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense having like a template that you can draw on. Um, but with that specific sample, it's quite a unique and bold like True. sound, and yeah. it stands out quite a lot. Yeah. And if you're using that across a whole EP, like mm. how do you make a choice and be confident that you can carry that kind of choice? Because I, mm. I would struggle to make a some like a decision like that. I think it's, it. see with that away that away stamp. I think it's in this track as well, this Georgia one. Um, do you know what it is? Is that it doesn't feel like it's because it's quite short and stabby. I feel like it's just a sound design element, and it's in here as well. So here it is. Um, yeah, there he is again. It's just a sound design element, but I do like things that are like a bit of a signature or, you know, and it's like, as again, as a grime head, obviously when I was growing up with that genre, or not growing up, but like coming up with that genre, there was certain sounds that were like, oh, S that's the snare. That's the, that's the Wiley snare. That's the yeah. pulse. That's this, that's, you know, that's the, these are the iconic one hits essentially. And um, I don't know, it's nice to continue on that culture and just create these little sonic, um, almost like logos or signatures that are like recyclable and you can just rearrange them in a different way. So I'm really into that. So that's my, that's kind of my thing. So the fact that I even found one that I'm like, okay, cool, this could be a little thing that I'm actually like keep it implementing. It doesn't, didn't seem like a stretch of the imagination at all. It just felt like natural. Thank you. Should I put that over here or no? Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I took the mic in it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just want to say thank you for uh, for the talk as well. And uh, like to be sure. honest, it really resonates with me what you're saying about garage and grime because I grew up with all of that and yeah. um, so solid. We're around the corner. Yeah, and same. Tri yeah, I went to school with some of those guys. So. Do you know what? New Trudeau's cousin used to live next to me. I see face all the time on the road. Harvey used to train me in football. Come on. <laughs> so it's one of them. Ones. Win Stanley. Yeah, we, exactly. Come yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Okay. <laughs> but. Um, for me, I had two questions for you, actually. So the first one is more like generally. So obviously, you said you were doing the blogs and stuff and, um, you know, DJing. When you started producing, at what point were you like, do you know what? I, I'm actually a producer now. Because at first, there must have been a point where you were like, imposter syndrome. I'm just making a few edits here and there and whatnot. But like, uh, do you know what I mean? Like, when, when was the point where you're like, do you know what? I'm actually a producer. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> Today. That, now that I'm speaking in CDR, I must be a producer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That imposter thing doesn't go away for me, at least at least for me. I don't know. Some people are mad self-confident and they're just like, yeah, I'm it, you know, and whatever. But I don't know. I've not been that person. Not that I'm not confident. I'm confident. But at the same time, in terms of am I a producer, I've always been a DJ that made tracks. That's the way I still feel that way. So, um, But I guess at the same time, you know, it's everyone loves that moment where your thing is on, I hate to say it, but Spotify. And or like whatever, fuck Spotify, but on a platform, like that moment when it kind of jumps out of your living room, your computer, whatever, into um, the the realm of the world does reaffirm, reaffirm you. So I think things like that, when it happens enough times, you start to maybe believe that actually this is maybe a thing. No, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, just because... I'm a writer first, producer second. People like the production. I pretend like I, I've been doing it for years, but yeah. I haven't. Um, and then the other one is, you said that you push the the levels of like all your sounds pretty much. Put the soft clipper on. How does that work eventually when you get to Spotify? And I think they've put like limits on like the sound levels. So when you're sending it to a master engineer, like what's what's that conversation? Like what's happening? There? Do you know what? I've got an engineer that is. Um, I'm actually doing my own mastering now, but um, up until more or less, but up until now, I've been, I've always worked with the same engineer, and. Um, He's been great because he just wasn't one of these people that uh, that are like everything must be delivered minus six 
un, you know, nothing on the master channel. It needs to be unlimited because he doesn't. He understands that we as producers want to craft our sound as much as possible. And that maybe the saturation that you get from that that loud master is part of your aesthetic, um, and he's never questioned it. And I remember actually because I, I was like religiously delivering everything in the correct way for years. And then one time I had a remix from do you know Claude Von Stroke? Do you guys know Claude Von Stroke? He remixed a track for us once um, off his own back, um, I should add. But he and I could see when he when he sent it, it wasn't that loud, but you could see it was squashed. So I sent that to my engineer, being like, "Is this going to be an issue?" And he was like, "No." You know, just like that, and really, really casual about it. And from there, I just kind of lent into that, really. Um, and there's been there's been no going back. And uh, the other thing is, like, we master stuff from like someone's lost a project, and it's a great track. Uh, we've really only got a, a free twenty MP3 of it. Fuck it, master it, release it, play it. People play it all over the world. What's the issue? Like, all these rules are arbitrary. So. Just don't, yeah, watch any of that. But what I will say about Spotify is you can you deliver the same masters to them that you would anywhere else, but they just make everything minus 6 dB lower. So, like, I don't know if anyone's ever noticed, but Spotify's output volume is low. And I think they've got some kind of normalizing algorithm compressor thingy on their, on their master. Because everything does sound a little bit squashed down. It's not too bad, but it's quiet, though. And I don't know why they do that, but, um, yeah. But you deliver the same masters to them that anyone else. So it's all good. Thank you for your question. Finally. Uh, thanks, guys. Really enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned about like in ear headphones and like, I guess, just are you mixing and working in headphones? Are you working with speakers? Is like one thing essential for you, like different points in the mix or like arrangement? Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, the about the in ear headphones, the earbuds, that's literally just for, um, I think it's important to reference what you're making in scenarios that other people are going to listen to it in. So even more so more so important than the earbuds to me are like, and when I talk about earbuds, it's literally just it, like AirPods, like anything commercial, whatever the most, most people are going to be listening on. But even more to me than that is I like to listen to it through the laptop speaker. Um, I like to, I love to listen to it through the, through the phone, through the, the phone speaker. Just because the, again, these scenarios are like where you really test, like have I saturated my kick well enough that it comes across in the mid range? Or is it? Is this just a club track? Or is this going to actually transfer into... Even with club tracks, you still need that, the mid-range presence for your bass elements to really sit right. And that's, for me, the ultimate test is non-bassy environments. Like, can I still hear the melody in the bass? Can I still hear the full presence of the full range? And if you haven't, then it means you've got to tune, go back and tune stuff properly. Um, so that's what that's for. I'm, I work on... I mainly work, um, compose and mix on cheap Yamaha speakers. Um, what are they? The little Yamahas, but the big ones are too big. The your eighties, eights, I think they are eights, eighties. Yours HSs, um, yeah. Yeah, HS fives are f the ones I use with the sub, because I do want the sub bass. But they're just yeah, little speakers. And then I've got the same set in my living room with, without a sub. So again, that's nice too, because then obviously I'm working with the sub, and then I go home and I fuck say I can't hear the bass. So that just means that I need to bring the whole mix more into that mid range presence and figure out where the harmonics are and bring them out. Um, so this uh, that's vitally important to me. Like, so the, the laptop test is the, the the phone speaker test is the ultimate test for me, really. Yeah, thank Thanks. you for your question. Anyone else? I still got a question. Of course <laughs> you do. Yeah. So, in terms of when you're working on your palette for let's say EP coming up right now or mm -hmm. so and so, and now you're trying to modularize and put your acapellas and then still use the same kind of kits, are you still using plug sounds though? Yes, <laughs> I. But I never had. Okay, I never had plug sounds. Um, for for those that don't know, plug sounds was a staple. Yeah, really, really rubbish, but amazing. Like also amazing. Like it wasn't a very good plugin, but it's a plugin that everyone in grime was using for some, a number of years. That just really made the sound of that genre. And it's like someone, I think it was Danny Weed, discovered it and just cracked it. And then suddenly everyone just had it on their computers. And it had a lot of sounds from um, popular modules like um, Emu Fat and um, Korg Triton and things like that, just slightly reworked. But basically, the whole grind palette was in there. So if you if you had plug sounds, you could make a grind beat that sounded very, very authentic. Um, I actually never had it properly. I had to install it on a Windows XP machine that I borrowed off someone else and then rip all the sounds I liked and just I just use it as a as the webs. But yeah, I still use it. Allegedly, would you like it? <laughs> <laughs> 
Are you still running it? Yeah, man. That's wild. And On what FL machine? Allow, That's crazy. FL allows you to do 32 bit and then put it into Ableton. So you're good to go. Sick. <laughs> yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah. I, I, love, I love CDR conversations. <laughs> <laughs> this is the niche <laughs> conversation in London but happening right now. The final question was. I heard a rumour that for Night Slugs you used to implement limitations to certain producers and submissions. Let's say, for example... Oh, yeah, there was a phase. But this is more... when my At the time, my label partner, Elvis 1990, was very into things like like the Dada Manifesto or I don't know. like <laughs> Just, you know. So I think it was... To be fair, this is more his thing than mine. But yeah, what we did was we had a, we had a sub-series called um, Club Constructions. And the, the, there was a set of rules for that. And to be honest, looking back at it, I think... Why you got rules, man? Just let people cook. Like, whatever. Fuck all that. But, you know, it made some cool music, though. Because basically, the rules were, it just is meant to be a drummy track. It's not meant to have too much melody in it. We, at the time, I think we said more than, more than three notes of melody, which was broken every time. Um, the rules are made to be broken, aren't they? So that was part of it. I think that it said it in the thing as well. Like, break these rules. Um, but it was just a bit of a... Um, it was just a bit of a way to try and sort of encourage people to make um, some drum tools, some, like, club tracks... Um, yeah, but limitations are good sometimes. Sometimes it's good to have, like I said before, I think we're living in this kind of like boundaryless world where you can mix everything into everything else. You got a sync button there, so it's almost like um, it's nice to na na now narrow our interest down a little bit within that. Thank you. So I want to touch on a couple of things. Um, oh, question there, go. On. Do you ever do any sort of uh, sound design sessions where you just mess around making some very esoteric, weird, wonderful sounds? Yeah, uh, usually after, like, um, you know, if you've got like a remix to deliver or whatever day's work there was, um, if, there, if it's not quite time to go home yet, then yeah, some like, it's, see what, what new synth patches you can find and what you can do with them. Definitely, that's the time for like cool. four in the morning kind of. Do you also ever jam with people? Yeah, for years I was working with um, a really proficient jazz player, um, jazz key play, jazz key player. Um, but you know what? In the end, um, I feel like I just need to do my own melodies, even if they're shit and simple. So, thank you. Yeah, we'll come back. So, a couple of things. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to hear. I mean, you obviously made a decision to start mastering your own music. Yeah. Um, so why did you do that? Um, and can you talk us through your mastering process? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so why? Firstly, because um, lately I've been preferring my own little home limits. That I, so my mastering engineer is working on, you know, million pound equipment, um, huge special racks full of blah, blah. But somehow I'm managing to get better results with my 30 pound soft clipper. So, But when you say better, it's all subjective. But to my ear, I just know what I want more and more. And I can hear the difference more and more as I go along. Because I think your, ear do, your ears do just train as you get older. Also your eyes as well. Um, but um, So that's the why. Um, so yeah, just starting to prefer them. And you know, if I send them a version that I like for reference, like, oh, this is what I managed to do. And then he'll do like three or four versions. And they're still, I'm still preferring my original one. Then I'm going to release my one, aren't I? Absolutely. So, yeah, so that's what it is. And I'm still, it's not like I've, I've not left him, left him behind. He's still doing a lot of stuff for the label. But just lately, I've found that I was getting really quick and good results myself. So definitely going to try and lean into that a bit more. And with the mastering, do you take, do you export the web and then put it? Yeah, what is your uh, mastering process? Yeah, I do, I do still for some reason believe it, that something happens when you've summed it that isn't quite the same as when you've unsummed it. So I wouldn't necessarily... There'll be stuff on my master chain, but then I'll tend to probably bounce it. So you see this one's got loads of stuff on the master chain already. Um, but then what I'll, I would have bounced this and done more stuff to it as well. But essentially, the if I was to simplify what I do, um, it's slightly different each time actually, because it just depends on what's needed. But essentially what I'm trying to do is find, because usually most of our track tracks have got a big bump where the sub bass is. Usually, I don't know, everyone's probably got that, right? Unless you guys are really good at uh, leveling out your your sounds, you usually have a big mountain where the where the sub is and i'm talking about when i say mountain i'm talking about where the spectral analyzer shows you what's going on in your track um should i demonstrate you do that obviously 
if you guys aren't using this thing, please be using it because it's very useful. It teaches you a lot about what's going on. So this is without the whole master chain that's on here. Yeah. This one's not actually as extreme as it could be, but there could sometimes be like a big thing like this because when you're doing, when you're making music for subby sound systems, a lot of the time the sub is going to be just louder. And if you start turning it down in mixing, you start to lose a lot of energy. So uh, I'm really, I'm trying to figure out how to control that without it smashing up, without the mix being quiet, without the master being quiet. Because if the sub's too loud, then you haven't got any room for any of the other sounds or it's going to get crushed. So it, a lot of the time it will be me finding where is that central sub frequency. Let me put dynamic EQ on it so that it's controlled, so it's not popping out as much. And then from there, I will do various things, really. This is a nice plugin. Uh, this is a multi-band um, transient designer. So can you see how um, I've got four bands here? Uh, let me turn it on. This is without, yeah? Without. Now with. Well, it's a bit subtle because Corsica is not exactly a monitoring environment, but um, this is just a way of, it's another way of essentially just designing and shaping the, 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 the master, really. It's just like how much um, mid sustain is there, how much you know lower mid bass sustain is there. So here I'm actually taking most of them out and then adding a bit of, um, a bit of, so making the bass and the mids a bit more sustained and making the low mid a bit, a bit tight, yeah, a bit, a bit more punchier. Um, and then usually at the end will be my lovely soft clipper. Um, but there's a few, there's a few, I haven't got exactly a formula. I will just approach it with what's needed and I know what the tools are and I just try and see if what, you know, what needs to be done really. So the masters from the master bus, you know, cause some people obviously master, you know, you yeah. export the web. Or the yeah, 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 yeah. I will, I will, yeah. That, this you know? is, this yeah. is just the master chain for the pre-master, yeah. if that makes any sense. So I will, I will now bounce this and then actually master it as well. So yeah, it's a bit techy, but yeah. That's one. Okay. Um, so, oh, so far we've gone covered for a, a lot of techie stuff, um, which is great. Um, and, you know, our friend kind of alluded to it about the whole kind of imposter stream go thing. But when, yeah, when have you had a time when it's not working? You know, what do you do when it's not working, when you're not inspired? Or when the emails are too much and you've had no yeah. time to make music? Yeah, what? Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, fair question. You know what? There are times when it's not working. Um, have been around for a little minute and you do go through phases of losing inspiration what i try and do is just reconnect with music reconnect with i know that sounds cheesy but like reconnect with the actual music that inspired me to do certain things in the first place like dig out your favorite old pirate radio sets um have a dig through itunes see what you can come across oh yeah this was good i forgot about this track you know and that's going to lead you on to just remembering what's like, just try and listen to music. Cause it's, uh, the thing is I, I work with, this is my full time. So I work with music. I also mix commercially as well. I master bits and pieces commercially as well. So I'm literally audio all day long, apart from when the emails are, are happening. Um, and um, so a lot of the time I actually, in my spare time kind of want silence, let's be real. Um, but that's not great. So it's like, it's about remembering to just still listen. I don't know how many people can relate to this because if you're, if you're not necessarily working in that environment, you're probably listening to a lot of music and enjoying it as you should be. But sometimes I forget to do that. So for me, it's about just going back to that and just, yeah, making sure I've got my headphones in. Um, or it's even maybe just listening to a new release. It could be as simple as that. But yeah, radio sets is a huge one because like when in doubt, I'll find um, like a Wiley and Dizzy Slimzy radio set, and bang it on, and it's gonna inspire you. Reset. <laughs> yeah, literally reset, ground zero. Yeah. yeah. And um, for those of our audience, and obviously people who are gonna watch this, what um, tips would you give people who are trying to, you know, model, you know, your way of working, you know, um, you know, running a label, looking after artists, you know, make making music yourself. You Delegate. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be like me. Um, shit. Yeah, just think about how you want to spend your time because i 
I'm only just thinking about this now at my big age, but I think it would have been good to actually structure my time a bit more. Um, if I was to give advice to my younger self, definitely would be like, look, you don't actually need to spend this much time like on the various behind the scenes things. Like find quicker ways to do it, delegate, find people that can do it for you so that you can get back in the studio. Um, Cause there's definitely been years where I could have been more um, productive. So. Any final questions for you guys? Gentleman over here. Yeah, I try to, definitely. I've got a few ears that are, you know, trusted ears, and I know who to kind of poke for certain aesthetics or certain things. Like, I've got my melody person or, like, melody people, got my production people, mixing people. Um, and, yeah, I mean, like, if it wasn't for... I think it's easy to lose objectivity in this, uh, but if it wasn't for, like, my friends in the community, then there wouldn't be any of this anyway. So I think it's important to keep them involved keep getting perspectives from others as well so on that tip actually how do you choose what um edits you're going to work on i mean i've seen you know hard body oh, yeah, quite yeah. varied with yeah, especially yeah. with recent releases yeah how do yeah, you decide? yeah that's true yeah because before it was just like um kind of more current stuff and then actually the first volume was just throwbacks as well do you know what it's just um this may be a bit esoteric but it's just things that i feel like i've dj'd in the past that could really do with a 5-4 edit where I'm like, okay, this track is really great, but I'd love to hear a non 4 4 kick drum here. I'd love to hear a 5 4 kick drum here. Um, so that's literally it. Yeah. And it's great because, in a way, it's not full circle, but you're kind of grounded in what st you started with, right? Edits, you know I mean? yeah, like, yeah, 100%. Grounded, that's the thing. But edits, edits make DJ culture go round, don't they? Because that's what, you know, is that's what a lot of DJ culture is for, really, isn't it? It's just to recontextualize things or bring things together that are a bit disparate or just, yeah. So. Just good for inspiration as well. So what's next for you? What's next for you? Um, starting to work on an album. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I didn't quite hear the... <laughs> starting to work on an album. That was okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Indeed. Yeah. On it's that, that time. It's been a long time. So it's, It has uh, been a long time. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, good luck with that. We'll Thank obviously you. keep in touch with you. Let us know, yeah? Thank you. But, well, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you so much. Up. It's such an honour. Thank you, guys, man. Thank you. Love.